Thanks for joining us. And you obviously are pretty serious hikers if you're in this session, because this session is, um, I think, one of the most important sessions. It's about how to plan your own hike and how to use the abundant resources that are on the Mountains to Sea Trail website to make that happen. And this is especially important to me. Um, I've been writing about the outdoors for three decades. Um, and at one point I decided instead of just writing about it and telling people where they could go, so to speak, you know, the good places they could go, um, I thought it would be fun to actually take people out. And so I started doing that about a decade ago and I, I lead guided hikes, I lead backpack trips. And my mission when I started doing that was to try to, um, try to give people the skills that they want, they needed to go out and do this uh, on their own, to be competent, confident explorers. And I discovered that a lot of people, if there's somebody at the front of the pack, they're pretty content just to let the person at the front of the pack do the guiding and, and put their trust in that person, which, you know, I, I, is usually a good idea. Um, but it's a great idea if you know how to do this on your own. And Jim and I, uh, Jim was gracious enough to help me on the, the first episode of my Get Hiking Southeast podcast. We did a, a basically the same session about how to use the great resources that are, um, that are on the website. And there's an abundance of resources. Our goal here is to try to help you sort them out and figure out um, the best way to use them for yourself. So that's, um, that's part of our goal today. And I would say that this is especially important right now and has been for the last year because the trails, as I'm sure you've all become aware, have become so popular. Um, and it's been crucial to try to find a section of trail that is not as popular. And amazingly, of the 700 roughly miles of trail that are done on the MST, you can find some pretty awesome hiking on a gorgeous weekend um, that is devoid of fellow hikers. So the great thing is we're going to, part of the, what we're going to do today is show you how to make that happen. Okay. So um, just a little bit, I think a lot of you probably know who I am, but uh, in case you don't, I'm Jim Grody, Trail Resource Manager with Friends of the Mountains to Sea Trail. And that, that means that I basically manage the uh, informational resources about the trail. That means everything from writing and editing trail guides to doing content for the website, helping manage the maps. I don't do the cartography for the maps, but I help, help make sure that the cartographer is telling the story that we want to do, that we want to be telling. And so I have my hands in a lot of the different aspects of what we do and how we, uh, how we put things together to try to help folks use the, um, use the, the system, the system. Um, and I'm kind of stalling here because I am not able to share screen yet. It's uh, disabled for some reason. And so I am trying to, um, trying to work on that, but. Um, You're doing a fine job, Jim. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you were having trouble at all, so. <laughs> but I'm kind of running out of things to say other than, um, you know, we, as most of you probably know, we have divided the trail up into 18 different segments. And within those segments, there are multiple access points. And we have what we call primary trailheads, and we'll be talking about that more in, in more detail later. Primary trailheads, and then there are other access points and um, that aren't primary trailheads, but are identified in the, in the guides and on the maps sometimes. Um, and those things, so we have across the trail, we have 248 primary trailheads ranging from Clingman's Dome all the way down to Jockey's Ridge. And 
I haven't counted, but my guess is we probably have about, I'm guessing up to 350 or 400 potential access points. So there is no shortage of places to get on the trail. And so the hope is that you can use some of this information to identify some of those places that are um, that are, are good for, to access the trail and um, and will help you create a, a new um, a new a, your own hike. I've gotten a note that says to make Jim et cetera co-host. I don't know Adam, is that something that you being a co-host that you can do? Oh, I can try and figure that out. Uh, yeah. give me one second. Um, because that will be what enables me to share the screen. I can't do that from here. Betsy may have to do that. Okay. Uh, Betsy says she's working on it. <laughs> so, Bless her. <laughs> Betsy's working uh, on a lot this week. Yes, she is. <laughs> yes, she is. She is. Um, and this seems like pretty much the first snafu that we've had. So that's a pretty good, um, pretty good track record over a day or, or so. So I'll, I'll just jump in by, um, I guess one other thing to mention, you know, we've talked about trying to find a place that may be less used than others. And, um, you know, the odd, the odds are pretty good, as Joe said, of finding a, a place that's not terribly, oh, I have to go back to the main room. So I am gonna jump out, jump out and hopefully come back in in just a minute. So Jim apparently was bad and he's been summoned to the main room. So hopefully we will see him again. Hopefully for all of our benefits, we'll see Jim again. Uh, oh. I would just say that one of the great things about this trail is you tend to hear a lot about the people who complete the entire trail. Uh, there are about 120 who have done so to date. And understandably, I mean, it's quite a feat. The trail right now in its current form is uh, about 1,175 miles. And to do the whole thing is pretty remarkable. About 700 miles of it is on natural surface trail and much of the rest of it is uh, temporarily on roadways. So takes a lot of determination to make that happen. And uh, so it's understandable that a, a lot of the, uh, the focus sometimes appears to go to the people that have completed the whole thing. But the wonderful thing about this trail is it goes through, I can't remember offhand how many counties in North Carolina and um, how close it comes to, uh, uh, there's a figure about how close it comes to a huge percentage of the population. And odds are that if you live in one of the main population centers of North Carolina, you can find a stretch of the trail um, pretty darn close to where you are. Uh, you know, in Greensboro, you've got it going uh, to the north. Uh, Greensboro and Winston-Salem, you've got it going from Pilot to, um, to Hanging Rock, and then it drops down and it goes along the watershed lakes in Greensboro you get into the triangle and you've got, uh, it comes in about Hillsboro, follows the Eno River, goes along Falls Lake for 60 miles, goes for about another 30 some miles along the Noose River. So you can find a stretch of trail really close to where you are. And the great thing about this website is you can find the spots where you can access the trail. And for the most part, um, there are about, uh, Jim's got this number, but there the access points on the trail, I think there are about 300. And often they're generally within about, I don't know, three to four miles. Sometimes they're a little farther apart, but a great example is up on the Blue Ridge Parkway where the trail runs for about 88 miles. And I think there are about 18 access points. So you can just drive the trail or drive the parkway and pay attention along the way. And you will see little pullouts where you can access the trail. Um, sometimes there's a, a, an overlook that is a trailhead. And the great thing about the website and with um, 
the guides that have been produced by the Friends of the Mountains to Sea Trail, they'll help you find those access points. So you can, if you're driving along and there's an overlook that's full of cars, you go about two or three miles on up the parkway and odds are pretty good that you're gonna find a spot that's, um, that nobody's at that you can pick up the trail. So it's a very, very, very accessible trail. Um, and it's, um, and that's one of the things that really makes it such a wonderful trail is that you don't have to be a long hiker to hike this trail. You can go out for an hour and find a spot where you can pick up two, three miles of trail. You can do an out and back um, when shuttling becomes okay again, which hopefully will be soon. You can go with some friends and set up a nice shuttle and hike, you know, five, six, seven miles on the trail. So as you will see here, hopefully, this is a very, very, very easy trail to navigate once you're able to um, figure out the, how to use the resources on the website. I am back and I can share screen now. So uh, everything is good. Sorry about the, the little snafu. It was uh, apparently, uh, I'm not quite sure what the, um, what the issue was, but there was some sort of technological glitch that um, made it difficult for them to make me a, a co-host. I don't know why. So <laughs> I am now and so uh, ready to go. Uh, I'm not sure what I missed. So are we ready for me to just jump yeah, in? Yeah, you can just you can just jump in. I was I'm not even sure what I said, Jim. So just okay. start going and we'll see what happens. All right. So um, whoops. Not work. Um, I just have to share the screen first. Um, all right. So hopefully now you all are seeing the beginning of of the the slideshow here. And so yeah, we can see it, Jim. Okay. So the first thing that we want to talk about is our interactive map, which is the um, sort of the, the central planning resource for all of the um, for all the trail. It's a Google Maps based map, and I will go into that now. And why am I not able to make this full screen? That. So sorry about this. I'm having some begins there. Okay. So hopefully now you're seeing. Hopefully you're seeing the interactive map page here. Um, all right. So so now we're on the interactive map, and just as a um, sort of as a, a sample here, let's pretend, let's assume that I live in Winston-Salem and I know I wanna go for a hike near in, in the local area. So I kind of zoom in here and I see that the, um, so on here, red means actual hiking trail, which can be trail, uh, unpaved trail, or it can be paved greenways. Black is the temporary sections on the roads. So I see here, in this area, north of Winston-Salem, I see there's a lot of red. So that looks interesting to me. So I'm gonna focus in on here and we'll talk about some of the factors here, but let's assume I've applied these factors and I found that this looks interesting to me. So the first thing, actually, let's zoom back out again, because the, the first thing we need to know is what segment of the trail we're on. That's gonna help us figure out the the resources that are available. So if I come over here on the left, available map layer, click on trail segments, and a, a, a dot comes up at the end of each of the segments. So I'll click on one of these, and I see that this tells me west to segment six. So everything going to the left of the screen from that dot is segment six. And the area that we're interested in is segment seven. 
scrolling back in here, the next thing we can do is look at primary trailheads. So if I click on primary trailheads, this tells me the main access places to reach the, the trail. And I'm seeing that there's a, an access point right here and an access point here that are um, have a lot of red in between. So that looks good to me. I'm gonna click and see what that is. So the first one here, Brims Grove Trailhead. That's a, a place that I, maybe I wanna start. And then over here, the Rockhouse Road Trailhead. So we're gonna remember those names because they'll be important later. And then the third resource on here that we want to talk about is mile markers. So if we click on that layer, there is a mile marker every mile along the entire trail. And they're keyed to how many miles you are going eastbound into, the, um, into that set particular segment. If you want to go westbound, you're going to have to do the subtraction. <laughs> and so, uh, but for for now, uh, we're going to go eastbound. So I'm going to scroll in here. I see that I'm just a little beyond this one, which is 16. So I'm going to start a little beyond mile 16, finishing over here, a little beyond 25. So it's about a nine mile hike. And that seems like a pretty good length to me. So um, hopefully a bit of a challenge, but not something that I can't do in a day. So now I am going to get rid of those mile markers because that is the, um, I don't need that anymore. So then the, the next thing that you can do with this map is get a little better sense of what the trail looks like and feels like there. And there's a couple of tools up here in the top left of the map, the satellite, so we're going to switch to our satellite view here. You can use that to sort of get a sense. So if you're starting here at the trailhead, you see we're going through some woods, maybe skirting along near the edges of some fields. Through here, we're going, it looks like through some fields, mainly woods here. But you know, it all looks like pretty solid canopy, wood cover, a little more, a little more field here. Um, and so on through to the little bit of road walking here to get to the trailhead, so on through to the end. So again, this looks pretty good to me. So I think this is where I'm gonna hike. Then the last piece, we'll go back to the, the main map here and we have a terrain view. And that basically pulls up a topographic map of the area. And so, Joe, I think you were going to talk a little bit about some of the ways that you can use this information, right? This is the most fun map. Um, <laughs> if, if you've been hiking for a while and, and plotting your own hikes, you probably remember way back in the day where you had to go to an outdoor store and start pulling out the USGS topo maps out of a huge chest of drawers. And inevitably, you'd have to use two or three different maps to try to piece together um, the trip that you wanted to do. But the great thing about those maps was the topo lines, which would give you a sense of, of what the relief was like, whether you were going to be hiking in a, in a mountainous area, whether there was going to be a lot of up and down. Um, and they're just great to kind of give you an initial visual of what the map uh, or what the hike is going to be like. One thing they don't show you is, um, this particular type of map doesn't show you whether an area is forested or not, but it does give you a great sense of the relief and a better sense of just how challenging it might be. So there's, there's a section right about where Jim's got his little hand there that, yes, there's a draw. See can, yeah. See, there's a level, if you zoom in too far, the topo lines disappear and I just got there. So <laughs> that's as close as we can go. <laughs> yeah, so here you can see you'd be hiking up a draw. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of elevation gain. There might be a little bit of water in through there, but you're going to be you're going to be hiking um, you're going to be hiking up if you're headed west to east. Um, and, and how then, do I know that? Yes, yeah. Um, 
And actually, this is this is an especially cool area. It's along the base of Saratown Mountain, which is the mountain that's in between Pilot Mountain and Hanging Rock. Uh, and it's there's a road that you can take up to the top, but it's most of that land's privately owned, just FYI. But yeah, so that's one of the ways you can get a sense of what you might be encountering on the hike is by checking out those topo lines and um, you know getting a feel for how strenuous it might be. And so, so you, you mentioned that we're going to west east will be going up. How if, if I'm looking at this map, how do I know that I'm going up versus going down? So if you look at um, most of the topo maps, depending on what the contour interval is, this one I believe is maybe uh, 20. Uh, my eyes can't tell. You'll it's see 30 that. Foot. Okay, it's 30 foot. 40, 40 so, foot. 40 foot. And you'll yeah. notice there are dark lines. So those are at regular um, intervals, I guess, uh, maybe at 100. No, maybe 200 foot intervals. Two. Yeah. But one way you can tell is they're going to be marked at some point. And right in the middle there, you can tell there's a, there's a 1400 and Jim's circling the 1200. So you'll know oh, that's the main way you can tell that it will be going up. Often, when you get to the top, you'll either see like a circle that indicates that you've reached the summit, or there may be like a long, um, kind of a long oval that would indicate a ridge line. But yeah, always, always look for those numbers. Um, so when you drop a, back far enough, you'll find them. Here's a good example of that circle that you were mentioning, uh, right? Yes. I'm yeah. Going around. Um, and here's a up here on the top of Soratown Mountain, you can see it's hard, a little hard to see, but there's a 2,400 foot oval that, that you were talking about. And this um, map, you can also see that on the, the south side of Soratown, there's a pretty deep drop. So some pretty cool terrain in through there. Although again, I believe that's pretty much all privately owned. There's a YMCA camp down here at the base, and so I'm not sure what's right above that. And the other thing I would I would also point out is one of the ways you can tell how difficult things are going to be is by how close together the lines are. Um, the closer together the lines are, the steeper it is. So back here, or through here, you're crossing hardly any lines, so it's pretty much flat. As you get up here, the lines are getting closer together. You're crossing more of them. So that's a sign that it's going to be steeper. So I think unless we have any timely questions, Adam, that need to be answered before we leave the map, I am going to switch back to the presentation. I think we're good for now. And that's easy to say, not necessarily so easy to do. Can you say again how you access this map, where you find it? Yeah, it's on our website. And this is the, the URL, mountainsetrail.org slash the trail slash map. But also, if you just go to mountainsetrail.org and the pull down menu for the, the trail will show you where the interactive map is. So if you don't remember that that entire URL. So if I'm hiking, this whole thing will come up on my cell phone. Yes. Oh, that's great. Okay. If you assuming you have cell cell reception. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> it won't it won't come up if you don't have reception. Okay. Hey Jim, a couple of folks want to know um, if there's a map layer for camping options uh, on the Google. The, there is not. Um, the way that our trail is, the, the way that our trail works um, and, and sort of the differences between the camping, the camping options, I don't know that there is a, a really clean way to have that kind of a, a layer. Um, it's something we've thought about and haven't quite figured out how to answer, how to, how to answer that. Part of the problem is that in some cases it's 
lengths of space where camping is allowed pretty much anywhere. And then in other places, there are specific designated campsites and how to, or, or commercial campgrounds and how to sort of manage those two different kinds of things we haven't quite gotten our heads around yet. So, all right, so the next thing that you should do now that you've decided where you wanna go is check the trail updates page. I know Kate earlier this morning said you don't need to, but actually that's, that's still not, not true. You still need to check the trail updates page because that's where temporary closures would go. So if it turned out that a tree had fallen across that, um, across that, that section of trail and we had to close it off until the tree was removed, that would show up in the updates page. We're not gonna do a new guide based on a, that kind of a temporary problem. So, so you still need to check the updates page. So we've checked it and, and that's um, this URL. We've checked the updates page and everything looks good. So now I'm gonna start planning my hike by going to the segment guide. So we said earlier, this is guide uh, segment seven. So we're gonna go and download the segment seven guide. And there are several, um, several features of this guide that you can use to help get the, the, um, the information you need. Um, the first is the primary trailhead section. So go to our, the primary trailhead section and you see that we know that now that the Brims Grove trailhead is at eastbound mile 16.4, so it's somewhere beyond 16, and Rock House Road is 25.4. So that's where I'm gonna now go to the hiking directions and I'm gonna start here at 16.4, and read through to 25.4. And that's gonna both give me information about how difficult it is and how, um, and, and what it, what I need to figure out uh, and, and, and be careful about. And it's also gonna give me some information about the aesthetics. So, you know, I'm gonna have a bit of a sense here that, you know, for example, here, the trail becomes a farm road. So I'm gonna be on a little bit of a farm road for a while, gravel road, and then um, you know, some switchbacks here that look like that may be a little steeper. So um, a few of these kinds of things can help you learn a bit about the aesthetics that you might not have seen specifically from from the, the map. One of the things too about knowing the aesthetics, Jim mentioned about the farm road. Uh, if there's a longish stretch that's along a farm road, that might make it a little more attractive for a winter hike when it's going to be exposed and you might want uh, you might benefit from the warmth of the sun by being on a road like that. So there's kind of all these things that keep in mind as you're going through here and thinking about um, the, the type of hike that you want yeah, to take. Yeah, okay. So I can see now that he's got things. Um, are you watching it? Hi, some, somebody seems to be unmuted. Carol, Carol, can uh, you mute your mic? So please, he's Carol? just walking through, he's putting up some things. Carol Reed, can you please mute your mic? So then the next thing that you can use, oh, one other thing I should mention about the hiking. Okay, good. Is that we showed this. Okay. In, um, we show, showed these as the eastbound directions. We also have westbound directions. So if you wanted to go from Rock House Road to Brims Grove the other way, there's a separate section for that. So uh, you, you're not you're not stuck with this direction. So then moving on to the elevation profile, the next feature that we can use. Um, we have a page here that has a sort of an overview map, but then it's got the elevation map or elevation profile here. And this is only for the mountains and Piedmont segments. The coastal plain, coastal segments 
are so flat that a, a, an elevation profile would be at best meaningless and maybe misleading. So we, we didn't do those. So here is the section that we're looking at from a little beyond 16 to a little beyond 25. So you can see here, starts out kind of level. There's a, a climb here in the, um, in the middle of it and a descent and then kind of some rolling hills before finishing, <clears throat> excuse me, before finishing uphill. And so that's a, um, uh, gives you a sense of how it's gonna be. It looks not too bad. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about this is use the, the distance scale on the bottom and the elevation scale to figure out what's going on. So you can see here, you start at about, whoops, you start this climb at about, about 1,000 feet and you finish at about 1,500. And that's, um, that's a, so about a 500 foot climb over roughly two miles. It's important that you not try to compare different segments, profiles from different segments. So here's two examples. The one down here is what we were just looking at, that 500 foot climb. The one here is from segment one in the Western part of the state. And I've marked a section here and blown those two sections up in the, to the right here those are essentially the same climb. In fact, the one in segment one here is actually a little bit steeper, actually significantly steeper than the, the one in segment seven, 5.2% grade versus 4.5% grade. And so, as I said, it can be misleading if you try to just directly compare what looks like a, what looks like nothing no climb at all on segment one looks like a big mountain on segment seven. Um, okay, a couple of other um, things to talk about here as we're talking about the, um, the, the profiles. One is keep in mind which direction you're going. So this is showing east to, or I'm sorry, west to east. So that's a climb, that's a descent. Well, if you're obviously going westbound, you need to reverse everything. So this would be a climb if you're going westbound. Kind of obvious, but worth mentioning. And there's a, a loose rule of thumb that a thousand feet of climbing is roughly equivalent to walking an additional mile. So this 500 foot climb here is roughly the equivalent of adding half a mile to, to your trail, to your hike. That's a rough rule of thumb. There are all kinds of other factors that matter. What's the trail surface? If it's rocky and, and lots of roots, it's gonna be more difficult than if it's um, a smooth dirt path. Weather can, can affect how difficult a hike seems, and even who you are. For instance, people with, a, with short legs might be bothered more by rocky terrain than people with longer legs who can kind of step over the rocks. And so you know, use all of this as a rough rule of thumb, and as you begin to get experience, you've gone out and hiked this segment, and you know what it felt like. You can say, okay, well, this either this 500 foot climb here was really hard for me or it was no big deal. So if I see a couple of thousand foot climbs here and there, I'm not gonna worry about it. You'll begin to get that sense. And that's it for, for this part of it. So now I think Joe, you and I, we're gonna discuss a little bit about what to avoid and what to, um, what to try to look for in terms of access points and trail sections. Yes. So one of the things in the past year, especially that I've looked for when I've been planning hikes 
is um, obviously trying to find some of the, the trails that aren't as heavily traveled. And the first thing that I do is look for a trailhead that um, one, <laughs> doesn't start from a visitor center. It's a magnet for um, you know so many people because it's easy to find. There's an address for it. Uh, there's a restroom, which I think the restroom tends to matter more to people than the, the trail itself. They like to know if there's a restroom that is going to be um, you know, either at the beginning of the trail or if there's going to be one midway through the trail. Uh, it's, it's an obsession. And so a lot of people will limit their choices to, um, to trailheads that have restrooms, visitor centers, um, and actually even just an address. Because a lot of these, some of the secondary um, access points, which I think are some of the best ones, are located on gravel roads, often at dead ends, they're often pullouts. Um, there's there's some sections uh, on the mountains to sea trail along Falls Lake that uh, the access points. There's only a handful I think that originate from actual parking areas. Some of the best ones though are are roadside pull-offs. There's one off of Cheek Road that I did last weekend. That's um, that was just awesome. It's a great stretch of trail going both directions and it's fairly flat, fairly easy, but nobody was there and it was a gorgeous day. So the trailhead is probably the first thing. Uh, the the di more difficult <laughs> it is for most people to find, that's, um, that's where you're gonna wanna look if you're looking for a hike where you're not gonna be um, elbow to elbow with people. And that's especially true on a, a gorgeous spring weekend, on a gorgeous fall weekend, when you get a lot of the occasional hikers out. Um, can I, can I interrupt so, for just, can I interrupt for just a second, Joe, to say something that I should have said when I was back on the primary trailheads page before, and that is that we have GPS coordinates for all of these primary trailheads. And you can enter these numbers into your mapping app on your phone, uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps or Bing or whatever, just like you would enter a, a street address. And it will take you to the Brings Grove Trailhead by entering 36.37133 North 36, blah, 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 West 80.41874. There's also a shortcut you can leave off the north and the west, but if you're leaving off the west, you need to put a minus sign in front of the number. So west directions are minus 80.418, et cetera. So sorry to interrupt. I just realized I forgot to say that back at the beginning. No, that's a that's a great point. And one thing when you're entering in those GPS coordinates, make sure you enter them in correctly. Um, <laughs> because the second GPS coordinate is preceded by a minus sign. And if you forget that minus sign, it will take people to somewhere in the Southern hemisphere. So, um, so be sure to get that, um, that GPS coordinate in as accurately as you possibly can. I think another, uh, well, this is kind of, kind of obvious, but not, it's not necessarily always true. Try to stay away from the major population centers. Although in the case of um, the mountains, the sea trail along Falls Lake, again, there are, there are stretches of that trail. I think there are 18 sections. Is that right, Jim? Do you know off the top of your head? Or 24, I think. Tw uh, including the Eno River? No, no. I think there's 24 Just, oh, total sections one. listed on the, on, uh, um, that they've done. Now, the day hikes are sometimes grouped more than one section. So there may be 18 day hikes on our website for that, I'm not sure. But okay. in any event, there are a lot of, a lot of different trailhead and access points along Falls Lake. And you can find, like I was saying, you can find some fairly, um, fairly lesser traveled sections of trail in through there. But I think too, if you go um, if you go west of Hillsboro, there's there's there are stretches of trail um, that are along the Haw River, and there's a couple stretches that are between like the Shallowford area and uh, Greensboro, where you'll find some really awesome trail and not very many people. 
So that's another thing you can do starting with that interactive map is, is just focus on places that aren't very close to the major cities that it goes through and see what you can find from there. Mm. I think that's, um, that's another great way to try to um, focus on a hike that's not gonna be nearly as crowded, uh, again, especially in the spring and in the fall. All right, well, I think we are close to out of time. I've got just a couple of other slides here before we uh, would love to get to some questions. So uh, I'm gonna run through those as quickly as I can. We've talked about the resources that Friends has put together, but I wanted to mention a couple of other resources that uh, some of our, the friends of, of our, of friends of the MST have put together uh, that may be helpful. We do not control any of these and we can't, um, we can't sort of verify them, but uh, we have found them to be pretty good. So the first is a YouTube channel called Side Trail Adventures. And he has put together a video that's very similar to our, uh, our discussion on this panel about resources to plan trips on the Mount Sea Trail. So he mentions a lot of the same things that we talked about here. And it's a very interesting and informative video. There are also a number of people who are basically taking cameras along the trail that um, to take pictures or take video while they are hiking. Side Trail Adventures does that. And there's another one that we know about called Pleasant Fiction, who is doing the day hikes from the, the great day hikes on North Carolina's Mountain Sea Trail Guide. And um, those can be quite interesting. And again, can help you figure out the aesthetics of a place. If someone has done this, it can help you figure out the aesthetics of what it is that you're thinking about. And then there is it's been mentioned several times before, but the MST guide app, this is a, a testing version of it for an iPhone, which is what I have. Uh, but since I don't have a, a, a Google phone and we are closing in 56 seconds. So we ran out of time and I apologize. Adam, are there any burning questions that we can get to in the next 45 seconds? I think that the main one, uh, um, will the presentations, presentation materials be available later? Yes, everything will be on the, the website um, uh, that's been recorded. Everything has been recorded and will be on the website. Um, we can also make a PDF version of the slides um, and put those up, I believe. Um, we haven't talked about it, but I think that is something that we will want to do. 